All right. Well, thank you, worship team. And thank you, Miss Becca. Crush it again. Appreciate uh, you making yourself available and your gifts and talents today. If you have a copy of the scripture, turn with me uh, to the New Testament epistle of Colossians. That's uh, toward the, maybe the back end of the New Testament. So if you've got a Bible, smartphone, the Bible app on it. Uh, if you don't have either one of those two things, no worries. We'll have the scripture on the screen. Uh, but if you're a guest with us, my name's David Witten. I have the great honor of being the senior pastor here. And uh, we are in the process of working our way, just kind of verse by verse, phrase by phrase, uh, through the New Testament letter of Colossians, uh, as the Apostle Paul writes a letter to the Christians who are living in this ancient city, uh, that it was a great encouragement to them. And as we're going to see today, man, it's also a great encouragement to us. And as we think about letters, remember uh, like when you were a kid and you used to love getting letters in the mail that had your name on it? Like before you became an adult and you understood what bills were and how they came in the mailbox and uh, before you had a mailbox stuff with junk mail and sales ads and flyers, like, like remember the joy you felt as a kid when you would go to the mailbox and you would find a letter or a card that had your name on it? Like since our family grew up, man, since my kids have grown up for really all of their lives so far away from family and friends and, you know, grandparents and aunts and uncles and cousins, like, like getting cards and letters in the mails from my three daughter, like, like, man, that was something that they looked forward to, whether it was a Christmas card, a birthday card, something like a, a Valentine's Day card, because typically, because we live so far away, man, there was some money that was hidden in those cards. And my kids were little, man, they used to just look with anticipation for the mail truck to come by. They'd kind of stand there at the window waiting for the mail truck to drop off some mail. And as soon as the truck would pull away, they'd run out to the mailbox and they would, you know, kind of rummage through all the letters and sales ads and bills. And, and whenever they would find a card or a letter with their name on it, man, they were just super pumped, man. They're, they're like, man, I got one. I got one. And they'd tear it open. And, and sure enough, there'd be like a $10 bill or a $20 bill or maybe a check from a from a grandparent. And, and listen, that's the same thing for my daughters now. We're still, even though we're closer to grandparents and aunts and uncles and cousins, we're still pretty good uh, a ways away. And so when they get those cards in the mail, even today, even though they're, 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 they're teenagers and, you know, got real jobs and that kind of stuff, as far as my oldest daughter, like they get a card in the mail with their name on it, they're pumped because it's got money inside. And, and the old ones are typically going to probably maybe use that for some gas. Uh, but chances are all three of my daughters are going to take the money inside that card and they're going to put a down payment on some very expensive overpriced Lululemon merchandise. You know what I'm saying? Like, hey, if I get 20 more of these cards, I can buy a shirt like from Lululemon. That's kind of what they're going to they're going to do with it. But even as adults, we get excited when we get like cards in the mail. And I say that because just last week, Melissa and I, my wife, we got uh, two such cards in the mail, like these handwritten notes that people send to us, then just expressing like their thanks and appreciation for our ministry here and our, our family. And, and what makes these cards so valuable is not that these had any money inside. What, what's valuable are the words because we know they are heartfelt words of thanks and appreciation from people who love our family and from people who we know are praying for us and our kids and our marriage on a very regular basis. Like regardless of who you are, like there's just something about getting a letter or a card that is addressed just to you. And when you think about it, that's exactly what happens here in the New Testament epistle of Colossians as the apostle Paul writes to the group of believers in this ancient city and he writes to them this, this letter and it's got their name on it. And, and the purpose of this letter is not only to lift up and elevate Jesus above everyone and everything else in all of creation and beyond, but it's also a letter that was meant to lift up and elevate the spirits of everyone who read it then and even those of us who are going to read it now. You say, well, Pastor David, how do we know that? Well, let's just kind of pick up at the beginning. And even though we've already covered the, uh, the, the bulk of chapter one, let's just start reading Colossians 1.1 1, 1, all the way through verse 14. And as we read this, I want you to just listen or pay attention to the, to the encouraging tone that Paul uses in this letter. I mean, it's a letter that he's writing Yet to lift up Jesus, but also to lift up the spirits of those who read it. Here's what Paul says as he begins this letter says, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, 
to the holy and faithful brothers in Christ at Colossae, grace and peace to you from God, our father. We always thank God, the father of our Lord Jesus Christ. When we pray for you, because we've heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love that you have for all the saints the faith and love that spring from the hope that is stored up for you in heaven and that you have already heard about in the word of truth, the gospel that has come to you. All over the world, Paul says, this gospel is bearing fruit and growing just as it's been doing among you since the day you heard it and understood God's grace and all of its truth. You learned it from Epaphras, our dear fellow servant who is a faithful minister of Christ on our behalf and who also told us of your love in the spirit. So so that's the chunk we've already covered. And then here come the passage we're going to look at today. Paul says, for this reason, since the day we heard about you, we've not stopped praying for you and asking God to fill you with the knowledge of his will through all spiritual wisdom and understanding. And we pray this in order that you may live a life worthy of the Lord and may please him in every way, bearing fruit in every good work, men growing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might, so that you may have great endurance and patience and joyfully giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in the kingdom of the light. For he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the son he loves in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sin. So that's how Paul begins this letter. And as we look at this opening passage of scripture, not only do we see the the very encouraging tone that Paul gives here at the beginning as he he gives thanks and praise to God for, for all that is going right and for all that the Christians in Colossae are doing well, their their faith in Jesus, their love that they have for one another, the, the hope that they have uh, that's based in the truth and the promise of heaven, the, the, the truth of the gospel and the understanding of the good news of who Jesus Jesus Christ is, that that Paul writes this letter and he says, man, every time we think of you, every time we hear your name and we stop and we give thanks and praise because of all that is going well and all that you are doing right. And so we see the encouragement that he gives, but then we also see the the importance of, uh, of prayer that Paul demonstrates in this passage because three times in 10 verses, Paul says this, we're praying for you. That every time we think of you, every time we hear about you, we stop, we give thanks and praise to God. Man, not only is he encouraging, but he says, man, we are praying for you daily. And the lesson for you and I is simple. That prayer is for every day and for everyone. That prayer is for every day and it is for every single one of us. Those who are doing good and those who are not doing good. Prayer is for every day and for everyone. And we know that because of what he says Again, notice at the beginning of verse number nine, Colossians one, nine, he says, for this reason, again, for everything that you're doing right, for everything that's going well, for your faith, for your love, for your hope, for the truth and the foundation that you have in the good news of the gospel of Jesus, for, for everything that's going right and everything that you're doing right, man, for this reason, every time we hear about you, man, we have not stopped praying for you. And here's the thing. Isn't that interesting? that Paul is praying for people who are doing good and living right? Because if you think about it, how much of our prayer time is devoted to, to people that we know who are sick and people that we know who are suffering and people that we know are even struggling in their faith? And listen, we ought to pray for people who are sick and struggling and those who are, who are hurting in some aspect of their life and struggling in their faith. But Paul also makes it clear that we should also be praying for the people in our life And listen, man, they are healthy and they are doing well and they are spiritually healthy and they're also growing and maturing in their faith. And the reason that you and I ought to be praying for the people in our life who are spiritually healthy and growing and maturing in our faith is because the people that are doing right and living well and living good lives, guess what? Chances are that's the person, that that's the family, that's the marriage, that's the home that the enemy is going to attack. See, as the old saying goes, man, any dead fish can float downstream and go with the flow. But those who are alive in Christ, those who are courageous in Christ, listen, man, they have enough backbone to to go against the flow, to swim upstream. And so, yeah, we ought to be praying for people who are sick and struggling, even in their faith, asking God to correct them and redeem them and restore them. But we should also be praying for the people in our life that are doing well and living good lives, asking God to bless them and asking God to protect them. 
Because when you're doing well and you're living the right kind of life, you have opened yourself up to an attack of the enemy. And Paul says, look, man, we're praising God for who you are and for what you've done. But man, we're praying for you. Man, we're praying for you, not just when your things are bad, but we're praying for you even when things are going good. And listen, that's a great reminder to all of us because how often do we stop to pray for the people in our life that truly are living well and doing right? Like we just kind of take those people and circumstances for granted, don't we? Like when your family, your husband, your wife, when they're doing well and living right, like how often do we pray for them to keep it up, for God to bless them and protect them? When our kids are doing well and living right, how often do we pray that God will bless them and protect them to, 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 to keep it up? Like typically, we're only praying for people who are struggling in some way. And Paul says that prayer is for every day and for everyone. And he even says that we ought to be praying for the believers around us that God will bless them and protect them. And it's important that we make note of that fact, right? That Paul says that when it comes to the believers in our lives. And listen, that's who he's writing to, because if you don't get that right now, chances are we'll get to the end of this message and you'll walk out of here thinking, well, great. All I need to do in order to get to heaven is to increase my knowledge of spiritual things. I just need to have greater understanding. But listen, man, knowledge and understanding cannot and save, cannot, will not save anybody. It won't save me. It won't save you. Only Jesus Christ can save us and get us into heaven and give us the free gift of eternal life. So understand, he's writing to believers in Colossae, and they've already committed their life to Christ. They're already born again. They've already, men, accepted Christ as their Savior. And Paul says, when it comes to you and I praying for the believers in our life, one of the primary things we ought to be praying for God to do in their life is to increase their spiritual knowledge. That when it comes to the people in our life, especially those that are doing good and living right, we ought to be praying and asking God to increase their spiritual knowledge. Listen to what he says in the second half of verse number nine. Paul says, for this reason, since the day we heard about you, we've not stopped praying for you, and watch this, and asking God to fill you with the knowledge of his will through all spiritual wisdom and understanding. So here in the second part of verse nine, Paul makes it clear, hey, we're praying for you. Praying for you in the good times, praying you in the bad times, man, we're praying for the believers that God will bless you and protect you because you're doing a lot of things well and a lot of things right. So he says, hey, I'm praying for you, but then he also kind of makes a subtle shift and now he begins to address the, the heresies of syncretism and Gnosticism that were beginning to kind of make their way into the church here in Colossae. And by way of remembrance, notice on the screen that, that here's the, uh, the definition of what syncretism is and what Gnosticism is. Because these are things that affect the local church even today. These are things that affect all of us if we're not careful. That syncretism is the combination of different ideas and beliefs taken from other philosophies and religions that are added to the Christian faith. That I need Jesus and then I'm going to add to the Bible, man, these other teachings from these other prophets, these other religious works, these other uh, the doctrines that these other religious people have given over the years, that, that that's syncretism, that I'm going to take the best of everything that I've read and everything that I've heard, and, and I'm going to take the parts that I like, and I'm going to add it to the truths found in the Bible. And then Gnosticism is a religious philosophy that denies the deity of Jesus, either his godness or his humanness. And claims that only those who have a special knowledge of the divine and the spiritual realm can be saved. That's how we define syncretism and Gnosticism. And this is the, 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 the seeds of what was beginning to get scattered here in the Colossian church. And so Paul makes it clear, I'm praying for you and I'm thanking God for what you're doing right and for, for, for what you're doing well, but I'm also praying because I understand that these things are beginning to make their way into your church and, and to people who are becoming a part of your church. And, and the reason why he does that is because the core of both of these belief systems is a Jesus plus fill in the blank mentality. Because both of these deny that Jesus is enough to get us into heaven. Both of these deny that Christ's work on the cross was sufficient to forgive us of our sin and to give us eternal life. And so the, the, the core of both of these belief systems is this, is that Jesus and what he did was not enough. It is not enough. It will never be enough. And so you need Jesus plus fill in the blank in order to be saved, forgiven, and to get into heaven. 
that you need Jesus and good works. You need Jesus and baptism. You need Jesus and church membership. You need Jesus and you need to give a lot of money. You need Jesus and you got to jump through all these other religious hoops. You need Jesus and his teaching and then the teachings of all these other uh, so-called prophets and religious leaders over the years. That the core of both of these is a Jesus plus you fill in the blank mentality. And so when Paul says in verse nine that he's praying and asking God to fill them with the knowledge of his will through all spiritual wisdom and understanding, what Paul is confronting is these two things head on and in essence saying to them and to us, listen, you don't need some type of new, fresh experience in order to get to heaven and to be forgiven. You just need to grow and mature in the experience with Jesus that you've already had. That you don't need some type of new teaching, some type of new doctrine. You don't need some type of new revelation from God in order to get to heaven and to be forgiven. You just need to grow in the teaching and the doctrine that you've already received, which is the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. You don't need anything other than Christ because in Christ is everything you need for life, salvation, godliness, holiness, and heaven. That it's all there in Christ. So you don't need something new. You just need to grow up and mature in the experience you've already had. Cause remember he's talking to believers. You need to just grow up and mature in the, in the teaching you've received. And you need to go deeper in those truths and in those teachings, because everything you need is in Christ. He's all sufficient. He is all you need. He is more than enough. So just learn more about Christ and who he is and what he said and what he's done for you and what he has in store for you. And Paul says, listen, you will be well on your way. In fact, you may want to make a note of this in the margin of your Bible, but that word feel in verse nine means to be controlled by, or it means to be uh, uh, equipped for. It's a word picture of a, of a ship that is loaded down with cargo and is set to make a trip. And by using that word in this way, in this occasion, what Paul is saying is that in Christ, we have everything we need, not only to make it through this life, but in Christ, we have everything we need to make it to our ultimate destination, which for the believer is heaven and eternal life. That in Christ is everything we need to get through this life and to get to heaven. In fact, he even gets more specific because notice on the screen, Paul in verses 10 through 14 says that in Christ, we have everything we need to do six things. Number one, in Christ, we have everything we need to have a worthy walk, to live a life that honors God. That in Christ, we have everything we need to live a fruitful life, to do good works that are pleasing in God. That in Christ, we have everything we need to experience spiritual growth, to grow up and mature in our faith. We have everything we need to display the Spirit's power and to live under the control and the power of the Holy Spirit daily. In Christ, we have everything we need to patiently endure trials because we know that God has a plan and a purpose for everything he allows us to go through in life. And in Christ, we have everything we need to joyfully give thanks, not for all things, but in all things, because we know God works all things together for the good of those who love him and those who have been calling to, to his purpose. And Paul says, man, everything you need Everything you need to live this way and to have these things be a part of your life, they are all found in Christ. He is more than enough. In him is everything you need to be equipped to live this kind of life. So Pastor David, where do you get that? Well, notice on the screen, verses 10 through 14. Here's what he says, just so you know I'm not making this stuff up. Verse 10 through 14, he says, and we pray... This in order that you may live a life worthy of the Lord and may please him in every way, bearing fruit in every good work, growing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power, talking about the Holy Spirit's power, according to the glorious might, so that you may have great endurance and patience and joyfully giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in the kingdom of light. For he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the son he loves in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sin. So everything, those six things, that's where it comes from. 
And Paul says, man, all those things are found in Christ. So you don't need something in addition to Christ. You just need to grow in the relationship that you already have with him. You don't need some new teaching. You just need to grow in the teaching that you already have. And the same is true for us as well. Now, listen, we're going to do a deep dive in verses 12 through 14 next week. And so for now, let's kind of hang our hat for just a moment on this idea of increasing our spiritual knowledge, because that really is the focal point of the passage of scripture that we're looking at. I mean, if you had to summarize Colossians 1, 9 through 14, it's, it's, it's really all about increasing our spiritual knowledge. And, and when you go through and look at the Apostle Paul's writings, and again, he wrote most of the New Testament letters that we have in our Bible, this idea of growing and increasing our spiritual knowledge, that is a theme in the writings of the Apostle Paul that we see over and over. For example, notice on the screen that in Ephesians 1, 17, Paul says this, I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious father may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation. Why? So that you may know him better. Philippians one, nine to 11, Paul says this and my prayer, this is my prayer that you may, your love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight so that you may be able to discern what is best and may be pure and blameless till the day of Christ filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise to God. And then Colossians 2, 2, and 3, which is what we're going to look at here in about two weeks, Paul says this, he goes, my purpose is that they may be encouraged in heart, united in love, so that they may have the full riches of complete understanding in order that they know the mystery of God, namely Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. And listen, we can go on and on and on and look at all these different examples from the life of the apostle Paul. But here, Paul makes it clear that biblical knowledge and biblical truth is essential to you and I being able to live a godly life. And the reason why this idea of biblical truth and biblical knowledge and increasing our knowledge of biblical truth and biblical knowledge and biblical things The reason why it matters is because of something that we've said before, which is noticed on the screen that when it comes to the truth that you and I allow to shape our life, when it comes to the truth that you and I allow to, to, that we build our family upon and we base our, our future on and our hope in, when it comes to truth, we only have four basic options to consider. Number one, we can say this, that truth comes from our senses. Truth is what I feel. If it feels right, therefore it must be right. The other option we have is that truth comes from self. Truth is what I say or what I think, that as long as I think it's true or think it's right, hey, it's right for me. It may not be right for you, but it's right for me. So, 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 so stay off my case. The third option is this, man. Truth comes from society. Truth is what other people say, what other people think, what other people feel. Or the fourth option is this, that truth comes from the scripture, which is truth is what God says. When it comes to truth, those are the only four options that we have to choose from. And all we have to do is look around the world and society in which we live to see how foolish it is for you and I to build something as precious as our life and our home and our family and our future and our faith on something that all we can say is that best is the misguided and fickle wisdom of the people that we have surrounding us. Like, think about it. Why would we build our life, our family, our future, our faith? on what other people say, on what other people feel, or what other people think. When all we have to do is look around to see people who, who, who say they know the truth, they know the way, that, that their way's better, and you look at it and their life is just blowing up. And so this idea that says, I'm gonna build my life on these sources, listen, man, that's not a good bet in my opinion. But you know what is a safe bet in my opinion? is to build our family and our faith and our life and our future on the rock solid foundation of the truths that are found within the pages of the scripture. Man, these truths and teachings that have stood the test of time, these truths and teachings that, that Jesus has, has given his stamp of approval on, that, that folks like the Apostle Paul have sacrificed and given their, their life for. Listen, that is a much safer bet, in my opinion. But listen, it, it don't just take my word for it, because listen to what God says about how important man, biblical truth and knowledge is in your life and my life. Notice on the screen that in Proverbs 19.2, The Bible says Solomon, the wisest man who ever lived, said it's not good for a person to be without knowledge. 
Isaiah 5, 13, God says, therefore, my people go into exile for their lack of knowledge. Hosea 4, 6, God says, my people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. And then in Ephesians 4, 13 and 14, Paul says that if you and I will increase our spiritual knowledge, if you and I as believers will increase our knowledge of biblical truth and biblical doctrine and the teachings that are found in the scripture, if we will increase our knowledge, Paul says this, then we will no longer be infants. In other words, we're growing up and maturing, tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of men and their deceitful scheming. And listen, this is where a lot of people live, that we say we know Jesus and we have a basic understanding of Jesus and the gospel and the teachings of the Bible, and, but we don't grow up and mature in our knowledge. And so guess what? We open ourselves up, man, to, to all the crafty things that society has to offer, that we listen to somebody on the television, on the radio, and they're famous and they've got money and, and, and they start giving us their wisdom and their theology. And we think, you know what? This sounds good. Sounds good, right? And so we take that and we add it to Jesus and what he did for us on the cross. That we take what they say and how they lived and we say, oh, that looks, looks pretty good. And so we, we take that and we, we, we add it in and we mix it in to, to the teachings that we have in the scripture. See, the reason why spiritual knowledge and growth and development is so important is because if we don't know what we believe and why we believe it, if we don't know what the truth is, then we open ourselves up, man, to, to all the misguided and fickle teaching and theology that this world has to offer. And all we have to do is turn on the news or the radio, the people that we follow on social media. And man, we all know people and they are fallen for what the world has to offer, hook, line, and sinker. And their lives are being ruined. And so Paul says, listen, if you'll grow up immature, you won't be like an infant and then tossed back and forth. You won't be open to all this false teachings. Instead, he said, speaking truth in love, we will in all things grow up into him who is the head that is Christ. And again, we go on and on looking at what Paul says and what God says about, about the importance of knowledge. But the fact is that biblical truth and biblical knowledge is essential to you and I living a godly life. And the question of the hour at this moment is right now in your heart, in your life, is there a desire to grow up and mature and to dig deep into the teachings of Jesus and apply them to your life? That is there a desire within you to increase your knowledge of biblical truth and spiritual things? I mean, hopefully your answer to that question is yes, yes, a thousand times yes, because again, notice on the screen that only in Christ can we live this kind of life? Only in Christ can we be equipped to live a life that honors him. Only in Christ can we be equipped and produce fruits and good works that are, that are pleasing to God. Only in Christ can we grow and mature in our faith. Only in Christ can we live under the control and the presence of the Holy Spirit daily. Only in Christ can we go through the trials and the sufferings of this life, knowing that God has a purpose through it all. And only through Christ. Can we joyfully give thanks even when times are hard because we know, because we know that God is at work and he can use this to produce something good in and through us. Only in Christ can we be thankful and have joy, not for all things, but in all things. Folks, all of that and more is there for the taking who will just simply say, man, I want to grow and mature in my knowledge of spiritual things. And why, yes, it begins with faith in Christ, right? Because again, that's the, that has to be the starting point. Knowledge won't save you, me, or anybody. And so again, don't walk out of here thinking, all I got to do is just know more information and I'm going to be good to go. No, man, it, you, you can know everything the Bible has to say and still miss heaven because you don't miss, because you've missed Jesus. And so it begins, yeah, by repenting of our sin and putting our faith and trust in who Christ is and what he's done for us and his finished work on the cross. But, but it continues like any relationship in our life. It continues with you and I growing and maturing in that relationship by spending time with Jesus in his word daily, reading and studying and meditating on it, seeking to understand it, and more importantly, applying its teachings to our life. And allowing God to change us through the word that he has given us. 
And so today, the question is, is there a desire to grow and to increase your knowledge of spiritual things? Because Paul said, I'm praying and I thank God for all you're doing right and all you're doing well. But here's what I'm praying for. I'm praying that God will fill you, that God will pour into you then all the knowledge of spiritual wisdom and understanding so that you can live a worthy life, so that you can produce spiritual fruit, so you can know and live by the Holy Spirit. Man, Paul says, I'm praying for you daily to increase your knowledge of spiritual things so that you can experience all that Christ has to offer. And that leads us to our next steps, and we're done. Number one, that today I'm making a commitment to finding my chair and increasing my knowledge of spiritual knowledge by daily reading the Bible. Pastor David, where do I start? Hey, we're going to be in Colossians to do December 31st. Just read it, read it, reread it, buy you a commentary, go online, find you some tools. Like there's all kinds of tools and resources at our disposal where you can dig deep into this letter, just like we're going to be doing for the next 21 weeks. And so today make the commitment. I'm going to find my chair every day. I'm going to open up the scripture. I'm going to read it. I'm going to increase my knowledge of spiritual things. Number two, Today, I'm making a commitment to pray Colossians 1, 9 through 14 over the people in my life who are doing good and living right. Again, how often do we pray only for people who are struggling and people who are in need? And again, we should pray for people who are struggling and people who are in need. But again, when's the last time you, you prayed and asked God to bless and protect people who are doing good and living right? And so this whole passage is just Paul saying, this is what I'm praying for you. And so you can use Colossians 1, 9 through 14 as a framework and just lay it over some people in your life and you can pray this for them. Let me walk you through it. So let's just say Greg's sitting over here, right? So, so for, for this reason, so following what Paul says, Paul says, hey, for this reason, because everything that, 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 that you're doing well and you're doing right. So I just spend some time man, thanking God for Greg, that he's a, a, a godly man. He's a godly husband, a godly father, man, for, for, that he represents Christ well, that he's faithful. Like, like, so God, just spend some time thanking God for Greg and who he is and how he lives his life. And, and God, hey, for this reason, for all that Greg is doing well and living right, hey, listen, so God, I just want to keep praying and I want to ask you to fill Greg with the knowledge of your will and all spiritual wisdom and understanding. And God, listen, I'm praying for Greg so that he may live a life that's worthy of the Lord and, and, and he may please you in every way. God, I pray that Greg will bear fruit in every good work, that everything he does will be with the right heart and the right motive. God, I pray that he grows in the knowledge of who you are and God, you strengthen him with all the power of the Holy Spirit. And God, I pray you give him great endurance and patience as he lives for you, as he serves you, as he raises kids, as he leads employees. And God, I pray you give him the ability to be joyful even when they're in the hard times. And that God, he'll give thanks to you for everything that happens in his life. And God, I want to thank you that Greg, that through Jesus, man, you've qualified him to share in the inheritance of the saints and the kingdom of light. God, you've rescued Greg from sin and the dominion of sin and darkness. You brought into the kingdom of light. And God, I thank you that you've given him redemption and forgiveness of sin. And so God, I just want to pray this week that Greg will live a life that's worthy. God, I want to pray that Greg will live a life that has good spiritual fruit that he produces for you. I want to pray, God, that you allow him to experience your power. Everything that we've talked about, listen, just you can use this as a framework to pray for the people in your life that are doing good and living well. I've been doing this for my kids, over my kids, all week long. Just spending some time thanking God for the things they're doing right and the things they're doing well. Because how often do we do that, right? Where we stop and we thank God for, for what the people in life, for the good things that they're doing. Typically, we're just praying because they're doing something bad and we want God to fix them. But when's the last time we just stopped and we thank God and we just bragged on the people in our life, the good things they were doing, the good things that they were accomplishing. And then we said, God, for this reason, I want to give you thanks and praise for who they are. And then we just begin to pray this. I've done it for my kids this week. Going to continue to do it. You can use this as a framework to pray for the people in your life. And then finally, number three is this, that this week I'll go to tbclife.net slash groups to get more information on small groups and Bible studies that are designed to help me increase my knowledge of spiritual things, increase my spiritual knowledge.
So we've got Wednesday night equipping classes that we offer to help increase your knowledge of spiritual things. We have Sunday morning Bible fellowship classes that are designed to help increase your knowledge of spiritual things. And so if you go to that, that page, tbclife.net slash groups, then you can see all the groups and all the classes that we're offering and that we've created and designed to help you grow up and mature in your faith. And today, if there's a desire to continue to grow up in your knowledge of who Jesus is, Folks, we have some resources and we have some opportunities for you to do just that. So those are your next steps. But again, it begins with knowing Jesus. So if you don't know Christ as Savior today, or if you're trusting in Jesus plus fill in the blank for salvation in heaven, Jesus plus being good, Jesus plus spiritual knowledge, Jesus plus being baptized, Jesus plus giving money, Jesus plus going to church. If it's Jesus plus something or something else, you've missed it. Because the message of Colossians is that Christ is enough. That Christ is in all. He is above all. He is all we need for salvation and all we need to live a kind of life that we've been talking about today. So if you don't know Christ as your Savior, this is your opportunity here in about 30 seconds to step forward and talk with one of our prayer partners about what it means to know Jesus. Maybe you want a night with this church in membership. Maybe you want to follow Jesus in baptism. Maybe you just want somebody to pray because something's going on in your life. Folks, we are here if you need us. So take advantage of these next few moments. So Heavenly Father, we come to you today. We thank you for loving us. We thank you for your word, for preserving it for us, giving the chance to gather together today and learn more about you and how important your truth is and how we need to be building our life on the truth that you've provided. So God, help us now to evaluate our relationship with Jesus, the desire we have to continue to grow in our relationship with Jesus. And God, if either one of those two things are amiss, may we take advantage of these next few moments to come to Christ completely and 100% trust in him and live for him above everything and everyone else. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. As we